أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المظلومين I begin in Allah's name, the beneficent, the merciful, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Anbiya. Verse number 106, he says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Indeed, we did not send you, O Prophet, except as a mercy for all. And tonight, I begin in Allah's name, and I send our sincere condolences to the whole human race for the um, anniversary commemoration of the Shahada of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who undoubtedly is the greatest creation among creations and the greatest human being on this earth. And of course, I would also like to send condolences on the Shahada of Imam Rada Alayhi Salam, who was also martyred many uh, decades later, but was martyred also in the last day of Safar. And these two personalities invoke in us the beautiful connection of the prophethood and the relationship of imamat. And I'd like to spend brief moments within this short span of time we have tonight to talk about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how Allah distributes his mercy to his creations through intelligent role models like the Holy Prophet and Imam Rada alayhi salam. When Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ And we did not send, we did not send you إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Except that you are a mercy upon all. Here, رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ The same word alameen is used as we use in Surah Al-Fatiha. الحمد لله رب العالمين Here is رحمة للعالمين Meaning the mercy of Allah is upon all the creations through the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as we know, the tragedy and the departure of the Holy Prophet was very interesting, and we need to pay attention on two fronts. For what the Prophet uh, fulfilled in establishing the essential nature of guidance for mankind, which he fulfilled it perfectly. And then, of course, the outcome of that fulfillment and what happened post the Holy Prophet with regards to the history that came after his departure. For that's a profound um, angle to show that the enemy saw that the completion of the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Allah says, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا Today we have completed and perfected for you our favor with the religion called Al-Islam the enemy realized that the doors of total obliteration, obfuscation of the religion of Allah is now impossible. Before there was a possibility, there were possibilities of intrusions, there were possibilities of total corruption, there were possibilities of eradication of the scriptures of God. And they felt, and the enemies felt, that they have done it before, when the pre previous prophets came, that now they could also do it again. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guarantees that after the Holy Prophet, with the seal of the Holy Prophet himself and the gate to the city of the Holy Prophet, which is the city of knowledge, which is Imam Ali alayhi salam and the remaining 11 Imams, it is impossible for Iblis to eradicate or for that matter to minimize or marginalize the power in the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we need to analyze that because when we examine the growth, just the statistical growth of Islam today, uh, you will see that it is actually greater than the human population. And I want us to understand that every decade or two, the human population doubles. So, you know, we're almost at 8 billion today. And so it's doubling exponentially. Yet the population of people becoming Muslims, meaning reverting or converting to Islam, is actually greater than human population growth. This is astronomical. I mean, even if you look at 
the World Almanac, they say that the growth of Islam was over 230%, whereas the growth of uh, population was 160%. So obviously there is something very profound here. And what, what is causing this? Well, of course, undoubtedly the truth of Islam. When Allah says, قُلْ جَعَ الْحَقِّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُكَ The truth is prevalent and falsehood is vanishing. Then of course, truth shall prevail and Islam is the religion of truth and therefore it shall supersede all religions and human nature as much as we are ignorant and fooled by many demi or what we call semi-truths there is an intrinsic truth within us that just cannot be covered and that truth starts to permeate through the human race and takes us over and it actually makes us makes us naturally subservient in that direction. What is, and I mentioned this before, but what is very fascinating is that if you look at the enemies of Islam, enemies against Islam, the ones who are vilifying, demonizing, marginalizing Islam, uh, they're attacking, of course, the Holy Prophet himself. This is very classic. You know, when usually I have debates with people of other faiths who are antagonistic towards Islam, they tend to bring up these um, historical uh, misfacts about the Prophet himself in order to try to marginalize his position as a powerful role model of guidance for humanity. Rahmatan lil alameen. But also part of that is the fact that they attack the, the uh, injunctions and the, the principles within Islam of womanhood. As you know, women in Islam as a gender are considered the flag bearers of modesty because hijab is a public duty upon them during the chi you know, childbearing years. And you find that um, they are conspicuously, outwardly um, uh, you know, raising the flag and the banner of modesty. And the enemies of Islam, one of their modus operandi by which to destroy the religion of Allah is to, to tear through the system of modesty and to make the immodesty uh, the standard of life make that as the institutional system. They're trying very hard, but of course it's backfiring too because even the women who are being used today uh, in a marginal position in economic uh, abuse, uh, they're being abused economically by being used to sell products uh, through their uh, sexuality is now backfiring and women are realizing that this terrible situation that the especially the male gender has established economically in using females, women as objects to sell products and to entice people in one direction is very demeaning to, to our women as a general human race. So it's interesting that when you look at the conversion, reversion in the United States alone, more than 60% of uh, the people who are coming, coming to Islam are females, are women. So you would think that with all the negative attack on Islam, especially on the attack that Islam looks down upon women, Islam makes women as second-class citizens, uh, Islam has instituted the hijab upon them, Islam has kept them away from education, which is, by the way, all of these accusations are all false, totally false. Nonetheless, you would think that the last people on earth who would accept Islam would be uh, women, females. But there's something naturally true about Islam. And you don't have to articulate it with words for its transaction in the physical reality. It's, it's just quiddity of nature is so powerful that one needs not say anything. You just simply recognize that that is modesty, that is actually elevation. You know, when the Quran says, Ya Nabi, قُلْ لِأَزْوَاجِكَ وَبَنَاتِكَ وَنِسَاءِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ يُدْنِينَ عَلَيْهِنَّ مِنْ جَلَابِ بِهِنَّ ذَلِكَ أَدْنَى أَنْ يُعْرَفْنَ فَلَا يُؤْذَيْنَ Here Allah is making a beautiful point, that telling the Holy Prophet that, you know, his wives, the believers, his, his, his daughters, the women of the house, and the believing women should don upon themselves a garb that is called jalabiyya, which actually covers the shape 
and the, the indecencies that may appear in public. And Allah says, ذَلِكَ adna." This is better. أَنْ يُعْرَفْنَ So that they are recognized with dignity. فَلَا يُؤْذَيْنَ And therefore, they are not bothered. This is very beautiful. So you find that this attack, while coming against women, the beauty and the rahmah, the, the magnificence of the religion of Islam, just continues to permeate even the enemy lines. And even among the soldiers who invade Muslim lands, you find that tens of thousands of them convert to Islam just by being present in that environment and seeing that beautiful lifestyle of worshiping Allah with simplicity and directly without any stories of God having sons who died and etc. etc. And you find the purity of the divine authority of God, the purity of the prophetic mission, the purity of the scripture of God, the directness is sublime and second to none. So tonight, in this brief oh, to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I see him, while I see him as the ultimate role model, and Allah in the Quran tells us, you know, in Surah Al-Ahzab, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Verse 21, where Allah says that the best role model for you is the Holy Prophet. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا He is your best role model. And we all agree as a human race, even among the scientists, that role modeling is crucial to how a human being can be raised properly. Therefore, bad role modeling, bad friends, bad society, bad leadership leads to destruction of society. So when we examine the finest role models, you will see that there is no greater role model than the Holy Prophet and the prophets who preceded him. And of course, the Imams who come after the Holy Prophet. If you slice it down and examine quality of human behavior, quality of long-term vision, the quality of the depth of vision, the purity of submission, the purity of the highest moral conduct. In Surah Al-Qalam, Allah says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Indeed, you're of the best moral conduct. And Allah is rebuking those who have accused the Messenger, you know, as majnoon, as crazy. And Allah is responding that you are of the highest moral conduct. By the way, this verse was revealed in the Quran to the Holy Prophet about the Holy Prophet in the Quran in the early days of Islam in Mecca. So we know very clearly that the sublime nature of the Holy Prophet is not negotiable and it is fundamentally essential by any standards. Even if we were talking about a generic principle of religions in the world, that one would have to admit that role modelship is crucial to the success of any society. When we vote for leaders and presidents, we look at their moral conduct. If they have good moral conduct, then they are the ones who should be voted in. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the world does not work that way today because the capitalistic, materialistic attributions come in our way and we end up choosing wrong leaders for the wrong reasons. And hence, we put ourselves in, in states of peril and cause our communities to suffer generations ahead as we're seeing the world in its state of chaos today. But we all agree unanimously that the highest moral conduct person, one who's God conscious, the one who has basirat, the one who has taqwa, the one who has long-term vision, the one who is selfless, the one who is altruistic, the one who is a giver and a, and a uh, you know, forgiver, is the kind of person that should lead. So the Holy Prophet is the ultimate role model. And I advise us all, Muslim and non-Muslim, that we should follow the footsteps of the Holy Prophet. Allah says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي Here Allah is very clearly connecting our love with God as a condition that that love will not be possible until and unless we work to follow within the footsteps of the Holy Prophet. Okay, very important. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ Then Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. So it's very crucial that if we are to claim that we love Allah 
and we have not made any attempts to figure out the life of the Prophet, to figure out his mission, to figure out who he is, to figure out the gravity of his mercy, to figure out the gravity of his mission and the sufferings that he went through and the patience that he had to endure by the foolishness of the people of the time and to carefully establish a system with which nobody forever till the day of judgment will be able to find faults in it because of the clarity of how it was placed needs to be understood so that we can apply it within our own day-to-day -day lives. And I think sometimes we give lip service to the Holy Prophet when in fact lip service is not acceptable in Islam. Allah says, أَتَعْمُرُونَ النَّاسِ بِالْبِرُّ وَتَنْسَوْنَ أَنفُسَهُمْ Do you enjoin others to do good when upon yourselves you allow evil? Allah does not accept that. What is essential is we must look at these role models and if we have doubts about the efficacy of these role models, then I just mentioned one statistical fact. We don't have a Muslim consortium you know, thinking as a think tank out there, figuring out how to proselytize Islam to the rest of the five continents so that it can be the dominant religion on earth. I don't think we have that capacity. I don't think the Christians have it. I don't think the Jews have it. I don't think the Hindus have it. And for sure the Muslims don't have it. We don't have any structural institution by which to go out there and say, how do we increase the population in the world to become more submissive to religion A versus religion B? The Christians have tried it. They've put in, you know, 50,000, you know, missionaries just on the continent of Africa. And they are not succeeding with all due respect. Uh, you find that the growth is actually declining. Even in Rwanda, after the million uh, people were massacred in Rwanda, the, um, you look at the missionary pr um, efforts on the continent of Africa is failing statistically. So then what is it that's causing this growth? I believe it's the Rahmah of the Holy Prophet. I believe it is the Rahmah of the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I believe it is the Rahmah of the Quran. I believe it is the Rahmah of the, the mere fact that the Muslims even practice what they practice, meaning the five daily prayers, the fasting, the charity, while we are not at the level that we need to be, nonetheless, it's incredibly powerful. And I believe that's why Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We did not send you, but as a mercy upon all. And here, Rahma, by the way, is you know, there's Rahman and there's Rahim. I want us to understand very quickly, Rahma is general mercy. It's like when it rains and there's a pious person and then there's an evil person. When it rains, the rain affects both sides and both sides get the benefits of the rain and they both get growth on their property and they get the, uh, the benefit of life. That's Rahmah. Rahim is special extra mercy that's only for the believers, the ones who have taken Rahmah and put it in action. When Allah says, فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ Therefore then let them you know, reply me and believe in me. Then they will be rightly guided. That yarshudun there, that is actually Rahim. So you find that those who worship Allah, having recognized general mercy, and now they take the Rahmah of the Prophet, they take the struggle of the Holy Prophet, they take him as a real role model they institute it within their lives and then they process that you find that that starts to become rahim extra mercy special mercy it's like giving you extra set of eyes giving you extra wings to fly or the or to increase the size of the wings so you can fly higher you know and to give you more strength in your muscles so that you can do more and to give you longevity, and to give you a perspicuous vision, and to give you depth of vision. That's Rahim. So this conversation here that you find Imam Radha salam, the Holy Prophet is the core, these are the epitome of mercy for humanity. Whether people recognize them or not is irrelevant. There are lots of people today using technologies that they have no idea who discovered them or who invented them, but they're beneficiaries of it. So one needs not know the cause of the one, the, benef the benefactor, the one who gave. 
you know, one needs not know that for their presence is sufficient. That's why the presence of Imam Mahdi, Ajallah Ta'ala Faraja, the mere presence of the Imam is sufficient rahma for the entire human race, regardless of whether you believe in him or not. And that's thing that's very crucial. Just like the atheists continue to benefit from the mercy of Allah, even though they vociferously reject Allah, because they don't need to recognize, because all they're doing actually is just teetering on the Rahmah and they're refusing the Rahim. They're going into Rahman, they're only just basking themselves in the general mercy and refusing the special mercy. And it behooves us as a human race that when we know that there is a gate and a door by which we can enter and open up the infinite treasures of God by which to reap the infinite treasury as a special mercy after we've crossed those basic doors, it behooves us to unlock it. So how do we unlock it? First, we must recognize that Allah says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ He is your best role model. But you need to have a desire to have Allah in your vocabulary, in your thought, in your day-to-day -day transactions, and to recognize that this origination of mercy from the Holy Prophet, as the Holy Prophet, is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from no one else. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the ultimate giver of mercy. Rahman al-Rahim. Who are Rahman al-Rahim. Right? God is the merciful. The one who is most merciful. And by the way, this word mercy, it has everything in it. It has justice. It has love. It has forgiveness. It has kindness. You know, it has the giving aspects of it. It has generosity. It has everything. It's an encapsulated word. And it's very hard to negate the word mercy. So that rahma is very crucial. And when anyone says, how do I come close to God? The simplest answer is become merciful. Recognize his mercy and start becoming merciful. Say, my Lord gives me every day, then let me take a portion of what he's given me and give it to others. Let me alleviate the burden of others. Maybe my neighbor hasn't eaten today. Maybe people in another country have not eaten today. Maybe that orphan needs some protection. Well, God protects me, let me protect. Allah says, that is my rahmah. When you see a believer, and this believer is serving the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this believer is studying or gaining knowledge or is now going to establish a foundation that will benefit a larger population, then help those people even more. And that special help you give is Rahim. It's extra mercy. And Allah Ta'ala made a beautiful statement when he was asked. He said, how do I live in this world? He said, be merciful with Rahman to all the creations of Allah, all, including the animals, the trees, everything, the planets, be kind to them all with mercy. And give extra mercy special mercy to the believers. Be kind to them, protect them, guard them, promote them, for they are the key to greater mercy. Because if you can take a pious individual and protect them and enhance them, then they will share greater mercy that is general to the human race and special mercy. So the Holy Prophet, in my opinion, exudes to me the most powerful element of all elements is rahmah, beauty, incredible mercy. And you can see it. Look, we have contentions and dis, you know, um, differences. And this is where Imam Ali salam, comes in the picture, that he was such a strategic figure in protecting this mercy of the Prophet, that he was the one who defended Islam with the sword. He's the one who eliminated the cancers in society. He's the one who became that, uh, the one who was, um, you know, the, the one who attacked. And as a result, you find that, uh, because of that, you find that there's contention. But the Holy Prophet is seen universally as Rahma, is seen universally as the gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we continue with this, uh, and tonight I'm just, it's very difficult to read the shahada of two great personalities as the Prophet and Imam Radha, but just as an introduction, and we'll continue to discuss them in the subsequent uh, weeks as we go forward uh, about the, the 
the importance of the Holy Prophet. Tonight, I just want to emphasize that whenever you hear the name, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Prophet son, Muhammad, son of Abdullah, peace be upon him, first thing that should come to your mind is just mercy, incredible mercy. One who will embrace you the minute you meet him. The one whose smile will affect you, your psyche forever in the positive way. The one who will, just by looking at him, you have hope. And by looking at him, all your sadness just flies out the window. By looking at him, just thinking of him, you begin to realize the real mission of life, the real mission of what we need to do as a human race, the real mission of we as human beings, that we must be merciful to each other. So the Holy Prophet is, is so merciful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves him so much that in Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah puts himself in the action before he commands the believers to do it. When Allah says, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi Indeed, Allah and the angels send greetings and blessings to the Holy Prophet. Wow. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi Allah does that with his angels first. Then, instantaneously, he commands the believers, Ya yu'alladhina amanu, therefore, O you, Allah says, O you believers, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima, then send him with the best of greetings, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. What we find is that Allah is sending the messenger this salam and salawat, but even that is rahmah. That while he is receiving the mercy, when he is sending it and telling us to do it, and when we do it, even that is mercy and rahmah. Subhanallah. How much can I? I mean, if I just speak about this one topic, and if I bring out the salient nature of the Holy Prophet's character from the day he was born in Mecca to the day he died in Medina at the age of 63, I see nothing but rahmah. So I, want, I just want to leave us with this thought that in his shahada, uh, there is too much mercy. And if we want to pay respect to the messenger, then we must be merciful. We must forgive. We must love. We must care. We must share. And if we claim to be lovers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we must obey the messenger. We must follow his foot, footsteps. We must do what he wanted us to do. Our love should be entirely built on loving him, number one. Number two, Imam Radha alayhi salam, you will notice, is the same. So he's the reflection of the Holy Prophet. And as you know, historically, Imam Radha alayhi salam, uh, the eighth Imam, the son of Imam Musa Najafar al-Kadhim, was pulled from Medina to what we call Tus, as you know, it's no Mashhad, where he became Shaheed. He's buried in Mashhad. Even that whole movement, while there is not enough time to discuss his shahada tonight and how Mamun pulled him in trying to use him as a political pawn, Imam Radha is a rahmah while he is being dragged by the enemy of God. His rahmah, his mercy made people become believers in God. That while he is being pulled, he is being imprisoned, he is being tricked. Our Imams were imprisoned, poisoned. You find Imam Radha as a, as a classic figure taken to a land of what we call strangers. He's called Gharib al Ghuraba. He's a stranger among strangers. The effect, the Rahmah of Imam Radha alayhi salam having been moved to Persia speaks mountains today. For when we examine the power of his position, where he is buried in Mashhad today, and the power he exudes from the grave as a living being who has died as a shaheed, we don't need to go into it. Go ask the enemies of God, and their jaws drop when the names of Imam Radha salam, when the name of Imam Hussein is mentioned, when the names of our Imams in Jannat al are mentioned, when the names of our women are mentioned, like Zainab alayhi salam, their jaws drop. Why? Because they are nothing but rahma. That's why Zainab said, "Ma ra'itu illa jamilan wa rahma." I see nothing but beauty and mercy. So, 
In conclusion tonight, I want us to remember that the Holy Prophet did all of this as mercy for us. We must respond. And when we remember their tragedy, the pain that they went through, that should be the nail in the coffin to seal us permanently, to make us convinced and dedicated in the path of Allah, never to give up our trajectory to promote the rahm of Allah and to make the human race come closer to Allah through his mercy. So when the Holy Prophet is about to leave at the age of 63, as you know, he gave in Hajjat al-Wada, appointed Imam Ali alayhi salam, completed all the duties of his religion that he came to complete, which was started by Adam alayhi salam. And you find that the Quran was completed, everything was completed. But he knew something, that this completion and the closing of the gate when he said, Ana Madinatul Ilm Aliyun Babuha, that the enemy is going to hammer it. The enemy is going to shower the city with arrows and poison. And yet the story continues, doesn't it? Karbala was that story. The Messenger of Allah, Jibreel, tells him soon, soon, within a few decades, this soil shall turn red. And he gives this soil of Karbala to the Holy Prophet Jibreel and says, it will turn red. And he gives it to Umm Salama, who is one of his wives, and says, hold on to this, for you will be alive and you will witness that soon this earth will turn red with blood. For my grandson will become sacrificed with his family on this plain because of this completion of this religion. And that they will be the gates to the city of knowledge. And the enemy will be hammering them, will be beheading them to try to break the city, break the gate, but they will not succeed. But you know, the pain of the Prophet, who has done nothing but mercy for humanity, and that rather than the human race respond with kindness and good gestures and to say that we love you, O Prophet, that we dedicate ourselves entirely, everything for you, O Holy Prophet, for you are the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this earth. You are the, the movement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in the metaphorical sense as the, as the way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And instead of responding positively, the animosity continues until today. So when the Prophet is sitting with his only daughter, Fatima al-Zahra, salamullahi alayha, and he's, tell, he's telling her his last will, and she's a teenager, and she was the most sought after woman in Arabia, the purest woman, the chosen woman of all women, Sayyidat al-Nisai al-Alameen, sitting next to her father, the Prophet. And he's revealing to her that I'm going to leave shortly. And he whispers in her ear. She cries when she hears that her blessed father is going to leave. And then he says something to her and she smiles. As you know, one of the wives of the Prophet Aisha witnessed this. And she asked her, what did you hear the Prophet tell you that made you cry first and then made you smile? And she said, he told me he will leave soon. I cried, but he told me I will join him soon. And I smiled. For a young, precious jewel on earth to smile. لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا اللَّهُ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرُ The one who has a desire to return to Allah and knows and believes in the Day of Judgment. That that situation where she's buried, that we don't even know where she's buried, is sufficient proof of the pain that not only she went through, but her father, who knows that soon after my departure, so much injustice will take place that my grandson will be beheaded, my other grandson will be poisoned, my other grandsons will be poisoned, until my last grandson will come. And he will establish justice on this earth. And that my brother, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, will be struck with a sword in sujood, and will have to fight it out so much to correct the misdeeds of the people. That pain, is the pain I want to talk about. That when the Prophet left this world, it was with that pain that he left this world. He says, Ummati, Ummati. We say, Nafsi, Nafsi. He says, Ummati, Ummati. He cares. He's Rahma. Wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmata lil alameen. So I say that that pain, my Prophet, I wasn't there. I will never understand 
the pain you went through. Inshallah, if, when I meet you on the Day of Judgment. But I do attest to this fact that this pain should not be put in vain. It should be taken to its highest stations. And to say, I feel that pain. I feel the pain of my Prophet. I feel the patience of my Prophet. <laughs> and I'm going to take this pain and I'm going to adopt it in my life. And I'm going to serve it. And I will be a witness on Judgment Day that your Rahmah has come to me. And I know that my Lord will recognize this feeling. And my God, just by me crying for you, O Prophet, just by me mentioning your family and shedding these tears, we say, that may Allah give us reward for this crying. SubhanAllah, where does this mercy stop? <laughs> and Allah Judgment Day will ask us, God will ask us on Judgment Day, what did you do with my gifts I gave you? And Imam Radha alayhi salam, while he's pulled, Mamun wants to use him as a pawn. And he says to him, I've decided that this Khilafah doesn't belong to me. It belongs to you, O oh, son of the Prophet. You would think that Imam would get all excited. Imam is a man of God. He looks at Mamun and says to him, first of all, since you have come to this conclusion that it is not yours, who authorized you to give it to me? SubhanAllah, such wisdom. I would have never thought of that answer. The Imam is telling me, don't be fooled by this, the glitter of this world, people calling themselves Amir al-Mu'mineen who are not qualified, who take the caliphate and they throw it like a ball on their laps. Then the Imam looks at Mamun and says to him, since you are not authorized to give it to me, why are you sitting on that throne? Get off. It's not yours. It wasn't given to you. It's not yours. But Mamun wanted to use Imam Radha for his own political benefits. You know, he was fighting his brother. He was trying to amalgamate his power like his father, Harun al-Rashid. They were all just hungry for power. But look how Allah teaches us, even in our modern times, when it comes to politics, when it comes to business. And there are people who are charlatans who try to use religion for their own benefits. The Imams are teaching us how to behave under such circumstances and not to be fooled by their trickeries. And the Imam takes advantage of that. That Mamun wants to show as part of his way, he says, look, I'll have Imam Radha debate people of Christians and Jews and the Magians and so on. And Imam Radha would, without any hesitation, defeat them all in one stroke. And there, so many would do shahada and become believers in the court of Mamun that Mamun could no longer witness this greatness of Imam Radha. What is it? Rahma, mercy. Subhanallah, Rahma. Then you find that Mamun is trying to manipulate Imam Radha. And by the way, he gives the the heir apparency to Imam Radha. Imam Radha refuses. You know what he said to him? He said, Umar bin Khattab made a command that six people are going to choose the next caliph and I'm going to name them. And who any one of them refuses, behead them. Imam Ali was one of them. He says, I institute that same command on you. Imam Radha says, okay, if you're going to force me to do that, I will take it, but I will not pass any judgments. I will not do anything. And Imam Radha takes advantage of that. And, and he constantly penetrates. And the people start to realize where the truth lies. And the straw that broke the camel's back was when it was the day of Eid. And Imam Radha was, was there. And Mamun says to Imam Radha, you should lead the Eid prayers. Imam Radha says, no, I will not do so. Because the protocol then was pomp and glory. And the one who leads prayer comes out on a red carpet and walks like a king. So Mamun insists. Imam Radha says, if you insist, I will do it. And Imam Radha takes his shoes off and starts walking on the street with the people the way the Holy Prophet did Salatul Eid, inviting people with takbir, Allahu Akbar. So the people became so attached to Imam Radha salam, they fell in love with him so much that Mamun got terrified. 
They said, oh, my plan to use him politically is backfiring. And sadly, as you know, he had poison injected into the dates and he offers it to Imam Rada and Imam refuses to take it. And he says to him, you're going to take this. He said, I'm not going to take it. He said, you will take it or else I will force it on you. And the Imam is forced to take poison grapes. And then Imam leaves after he takes a bite from that. And Imam says, where are you going? He said, I'm going to where you're sending me. That pain, I put the two together. It's the pain we must all feel, but positive pain. The kind where we're going to take it and move it in directions, indomitably, become smart, wise, intelligent, upright role models, and become articulate enough to let the world know that the religion of truth is here, it shall, it shall penetrate. That my blessed prophet left this world, Imam Ali salam gave it the ghusl to such a degree that nobody could look at the body of the prophet that while he is being washed, others are busy with politics, not caring about rahmatul alameen. Imam Ali salam washed him, buried him, and today in that blessed masjid where the mosque of the Prophet, the house of the Prophet, he is buried right there as rahmatul alameen. And Imam Rada salam is buried in Mashhad. Mamun wanted to bury him at the foot of his father. He failed. And today, if you go to Mashhad, you will find millions and millions and millions of people, 24 by 7, just glued to the grave of Imam Rada salam. If this is not Rahmah, you go to Medina and see the grave of the Prophet wasallam. If that is not a Rahmah, I don't know what is Rahmah. May Allah bless you all. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ربنا اغفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف الرحيم May Allah grant us the strength brothers and sisters not only in faith but all those outside of Islam to, for we are all equals in humanity that oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us greater mercy tranquility, success and let's love each other forgive each other and share what Allah has given us and alleviate the burden and the poverty of the human race and let us obey and follow the way Allah intends us to obey and inshallah you and I will be very successful in this world and in the next. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.